Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. Thank you, as always, for joining us. In the spotlight is Roy Peter Clark. He is an American writer, editor, and writing coach. He's a senior scholar and vice president at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, a place I've visited a couple different times. If you're not familiar with the Pointer Institute, it's probably because you're not in journalism, but it's a journalism think tank based in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, it is one of those places where you learn to write and report and interview use social media and so on at a very high level. And uh, I think back, I, I've known Roy Peter Clark by name for many, many years. Uh, I've never met him in person. So I'm really glad to have him on the program. I met one of his mentors, Don Fry, a couple of times at the Pointer Institute. Uh, so Roy Peter Clark is also the author uh, and editor of 18 books. His most uh, recent include Writing Tools, The Glamour of Grammar, Help, put an exclamation point after help for writers, <laughs> and uh, how to write short. And uh, the one we're going to be talking about today, not exclusively necessarily, but the art of x ray reading. And uh, he will explain um, what x ray reading really is. And I have to tell you that when people say, What's the best writing books you've read? There's three that I would tell people, well, two in particular The Art and Craft of Feature Writing by Bill Blundell who actually gets a mention in, in the book we're going to be talking about. The other is Sin and Syntax by Constance Hale. And I often will throw in Story by screenwriter Robert McKee, which is a terrific book uh, that very focused on storytelling. But I will add to that list now, having just read The Art of X-Ray Reading. I just completed that book. Uh, I will add The Art of X-Ray Reading. It's, it's a really uh, great piece of writing. And that's the thing about... You see people write writing books and then the writing in the writing book is bland. That's not the case with Bill Blundell or Constance Hale or Robert McKee. It's actually electrifying. And this also holds true for Roy Peter Clark. His book is just outstanding. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those writers who writes about writing. Um, he's, he's got a enormous passion for it, as do I and I think all of our listeners do as well. Roy Peter Clark, uh, with that, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's tremendously uh, happy for me to uh, to be with you in a conversation from uh, one end of the country to the other. It's uh, here, it's great to, we go. to talk and celebrate the craft. So you're in St. Petersburg, is that right, Roy? Yeah, I've been, I've been living in St. Petersburg, Florida since 1977. I grew up, I was born in the Lower East Side of New York City. I grew up on Long Island, went to school in New England, and then headed south uh, for a career as a young, uh, um, young English professor and uh, uh, managed to stumble really uh, by accident into, uh, into journalism and have been with the Pointer Institute and with the Tampa Bay Times newspaper uh, since the 1970s. In the Tampa Bay Times is almost like a, uh, that is a, newspaper, an experimental newspaper. Now, you you, you check me on this, but uh, it's where a lot of the concepts that are developed at the Pointer Institute are actually executed. Is that right and tested? So the, the Institute was, is a nonprofit school that owns uh, what was originally the St. Petersburg Times, now the Tampa Bay Times, uh, winner of, I think, 13 Pulitzer Prizes, the inventor of um, PolitiFact, which won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, which is now housed at the Pointer Institute. So it's a school that that owns a newspaper, and uh, of course, like many other newspapers, the the Tampa Bay Times uh, has struggled financially, but has always been for those of us at the Pointer Institute uh, a place where we could, um, you know, we could watch uh, news writing in action and learn from it every day. Yeah. Well, and 13 Pulitzer Prizes, obviously what the Pointer Institute is doing is working. Um, now, 
I didn't know about PolitiFact. Wow, that's impressive that PolitiFact comes out of the Pointer Institute. So, um, and, and that won a Pulitzer Prize as well, as you said. Now, you also have the National Writers Workshop. And before we get into X-ray reading, I just wanted you to tip your hat. Uh, and I do know you wear hats sometimes, just from the photography <laughs> I've seen of you. Uh, so, and not just baseball caps, um, even though you're, I, I take it you're a big baseball fan. But you've got the National Writers Workshop. Maybe that's something that I went through when I was at Pointer. I don't even know. What exactly is that? Could you put some flesh on those bones? It, it existed. The, the National Writers Workshop was um, created in uh, as, an, as a kind of a extension of a, a writing conference, a public writing conference that was held in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And... Uh, sponsored by the newspaper there. And I was invited to come and be a speaker. And uh, this was somewhere in the 1990s. And I remember the tremendous enthusiasm uh, by people, not just journalists, but by students, by teachers, by public writers of all kind who wanted to grow in their craft. And I came back to St. Petersburg and testified at this amazing sort of energy and over the next decade, um, we became the Point Institute became the umbrella for uh, these these um, uh, I guess up to ten or twelve different news organizations would sponsor these in, all over the country, and uh, more than fifty thousand people attended these uh, when they were still going on, um, and. The main lesson was that that, um, uh, that good writing uh, was something that um, many different kinds of public writers were interested in, not just uh, journalists, and that uh, there was an appetite for people to grow in their craft. And this is essentially what I've always assumed is my mission, not just to help the writers at the the Tampa Bay Times, but uh, to really think about what it means to create a sort of a nation of writers where uh, writing would become, would emerge, evolve into as public a literacy as, as reading is. And um, yeah, I've had uh, more than uh, 40 years and now I'm working on my 20th book uh, headed for that goal. There you go. So all this journalism experience you've got, all this journalism training that you have uh, um, uh, provided to people, but X-ray reading actually ta talks about you take the classics in literature and you take 25 in that book, but there's obviously many more than that that people can avail themselves of. And uh, you really teach in this book what's called X-ray reading to understand what it is they're doing that is working so that we can take those lessons and apply them to our own writing. And so this is, this is, a, uh, this is why I wanted uh, Roy to be on the program is because here we are fiction writers. I mean, I, I'm still a journalist, but I'm also a fiction writer. And um, the way he analyzes what's being done by people that we all know, like Fitzgerald and Hemingway and Toni Morrison and so on. Uh, is is extremely instructive. And before we launch into that, Roy, I just want you to x-ray read your own name because for years I've wondered, why are you not Roy Clark? You're Roy Peter Clark. And uh, what's the x-ray? There's a story behind that. And what's the x-ray reading on that? Or what's the story behind why you use uh, your name, a, a, tr a triple barrel name? Uh, great question. And uh, I think I have a colorful answer. Uh, it begins with the fact that I'm named after my two grandfathers. Uh, I grew up in a uh, an Italian Jewish family <laughs> where um, a lot of relatives, a lot of children were <laughs> were named after dead relatives. <laughs> I get it. I'm I get about it. it, right? Uh, and so uh, Roy Clark, my grandfather died in uh, 19, uh, 1942. I was born in 1948. And 
I'm delighted. He was uh, apparently a, uh, was a wonderful person. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, an early, uh, just as people, we know the invention of the internet uh, during the time of Thomas Edison, he was uh, an early uh, electrician and made his, his trade uh, that way. Now, I was pretty much raised uh, with my Italian grandfather, Peter Marino. And his story of his name is that um, I, I have the ship's manifest uh, when he came from, he and his family came from Naples to Ellis Island, and he was four years old. And Peter is an, uh, is an, an anglicized, Americanized version of his actual name, which was Pellegrino. And oh, I believe, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind being Roy Pellegrino Clark. <laughs> yeah, it's got panache cool. for sure. And let and, and check this out. Or Pellegrino, I think is, I think I think the word means or is related to the word that means pilgrim. And Marino, the family last name is Mariner. So here is a four-year-old boy who is a pilgrim mariner on a ship called the Nord America headed from uh, Italy to Ellis Island where they would uh, they would uh, create their their new home on the Lower East Side uh, of New York. Now, when I uh, started um, writing stories for journalism, Mike, uh, I was teaching uh, as a young assistant professor in the early 1970s in Montgomery, Alabama, at a branch campus of Auburn University. And I started writing about uh, my experiences in the South. And uh, I wrote about language, I wrote about religion, I wrote about uh, political culture, and I wrote about country music. And um, there's a Roy Clark there too. There's a Roy Clark there. Uh, and so the New York Times published an op-ed piece that I wrote called Unbuckling the Bible Belt. And um, they kind of talked to them and said, you know, maybe could you use your like a middle initial at least? Uh, and I said, well, listen, I have a short name. Let's let's go all the way. Roy Peter Clark. And uh, back in, uh, oh, I guess about, must have been about, about 10 years ago. I met the country western star, and we were photographed uh, together. Our pictures appeared in the uh, uh, in the Tampa Bay Times, and so we had a good good laugh about that. Um, now, one other thing, if I may say, and this is what you get for asking me about my name, is that I sometimes sort of, sort of think about. I think a lot about names and the origins of names, and in real life, and ones that are created. And so Roy uh, is comes from the sort of, uh, I guess, the sort of French version of the word king. You see the word royal, king. Peter uh, is, uh, you know, comes from Petrus, uh, uh, the apostle Peter. He's the rock. Mm -hmm. And Clark uh, is related to uh, the English word uh, clerk or cleric, which is actually a, a uh, an occupational name like Miller or Smith. So a, a clerk in Chaucer's time was anybody who could uh, who could read or write. So in short, finally, uh, my name translates to King Rock Writer, and I'm stuck with that. <laughs> There you have it. There is a story behind the name, and a co quite significant one. Now, let's talk about x-ray reading. I, I did a little gesture, draw, verbal gesture drawing of what it is, uh, Roy, but you go ahead and tell our listeners um, uh, how, your description of x-ray reading. So when I was um, a kid, I'm still a kid in many respects, I'll still occasionally read uh, an old comic book, Superman or Batman or Sergeant Fury and his howling commandos or whatever it happens to be. And, um, and they used to have these, uh, <laughs> these 
gag gifts that you could order. Uh, and uh, one of them were uh, x-ray glasses. Uh, supposedly, you'd order, you'd order these glasses, you'd put them on, and uh, it'd help you uh, uh, look through things. So you could, you could. I, I think one of the appeals to the boys, like you know, you could supposedly you could uh, you could look uh, through people's clothes and see everybody uh, naked. And <laughs> and boys, I guess we're we're suckers for that. In I remember those. I remember those. Interesting. Yeah. In fact, I was suckered in. I, I got him too. <laughs> it's unbelievable what a what a young uh, teenage uh, young teenage boy will will fall for. Oh boy! So um, so, but for me, it became a metaphor. And in uh, in classes, I, when I teach uh, writers and teachers, I sometimes uh, give out these uh, metaphorical X ray glasses. And I say, put them on. Now look at this text that you think so highly of, that you want to appreciate. And, you know, when we read a text, a literary text, if we're English majors like I was, I did a dissertation on the Canterbury Tales, um, you, you were trained to close read something and also to extract meaning from the text, Th themes, ways of looking at the world, those kinds of things, cultural history. I said, but there's another step that in literary analysis we too often miss, and that's to look beneath the surface of the text, to reverse engineer the text in a way, to use a different metaphor, to see all of the devices, all of the strategies that the writer is using to create the effects that we're feeling. Why am I laughing? Why am I crying? Why am I outraged? Why am I informed? Uh, a text is a contraption, in essence, created by uh, a writer, a poet, a novelist, a journalist, using a variety of strategies. And those strategies have different names. We call them grammar and syntax and poetics and rhetoric and uh, dialogue and narrative strategies and those kinds of things. Mm. And the idea is, is that close reading, ex close reading doesn't get you quite deep enough, but X-ray reading can do that. And what X-ray reading will do was, will, will turn a text into what high school teachers call a mentor text that reveals to you the strategies that you can now, the tools that you can put on your workbench. And I can, I can think of a, uh, an example uh, without actually referring directly uh, 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 to, to, to the book. And it comes from Shirley Jackson's, an x-ray reading of Shirley Jackson's uh, famous story, The Lottery, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the most anthologized short stories of the 20th century. I don't know if people read it anymore. Written in 1948. Appeared in the New Yorker magazine and uh, was greeted by readers who were outraged that such a terrible place could exist in America. Uh, a place where these terrible lottery rituals existed. I guess to do this, it has to be a, a spoiler alert, but we can't get around it, right? Um, no, go right ahead. The winner, yeah. the winner of the lottery, Mrs. Hutchinson, as I recall, is stoned to death uh, in the final uh, passage of this short and terrifying story. And I remember reading it for the first time in high school and being 
horrified and terrified and slightly traumatized by this story, which felt so real that the, the readers, even of The New Yorker, uh, 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 overlooked the fact that it was fictionalized. Right. And A sophisticated readership. Yeah. Uh, now, it is true, right, uh, to put it in historical context, three years later, three, this is three years after the discovery of the concentration camps and what we now call the Holocaust. So uh, um, the, um, the, the discovery of, of these scapegoating horrors uh, was not too far from sort of recent history. But when you read, uh, I don't have it, uh, I don't have it in front of me. I'm doing this from my ancient memory. Mm -hmm. When you read the text and it opens uh, on this town square where this lottery is going to take place and the boys are down by, I guess, by the lakefront and they're stuffing stones in their pockets. Now, very often with foreshadowing, you have to read it twice to see what you didn't see the first time around. But there it was. In the second or third paragraph, these children who were stiff stuffing rocks in their pocket, I thought maybe to play skipping stones, you know, across the lake or whatever. Yeah. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're getting ready to kill Mrs. Hutchinson. And so it's that's now I have a word foreshadowing. It's a little different than foreboding. That allows me to see something in a text that I can use, I can name it, I can put it on my toolbox, uh, in my toolbox, in my workbench, and someday it's there uh, if I need it. Now, that, that short story probably led me to a deeper x-ray reading of the Great Gatsby, which um, is the is the I write I write too much, so I forget these things. I believe the Gatsby is the first chapter in the book. Yes, that is correct. So, when I wrote a book, Writing Tools, uh, there's a chapter about endings, and there's a reference to the ending of the Great Gatsby, which is a, a famous, maybe one of the most famous endings of an American novel. Uh, people committed to memory. Um, and um, there's our narrator, Nick Carraway, standing, I guess, on the shore of, uh, of Long Island Sound to the spot where he um, saw Gatsby for the first time at one of his parties. Gatsby is looking out, and in the distance, he's reaching out, and... and, and, and He's reaching out to this green light, which turns out to be the light on the end of the pier on Daisy's house, his, his lost beloved. And um, and yeah, I went back and read the the ending of chapter one, and there was Gatsby looking out in that same spot and the green light. So at the end of the first chapter and at the end of the novel, there is that green light. And in some uh, illustrations that come out of Gatsby, the green light is sometimes used or evoked. Now, I said to myself, is it reasonable for an author in a 200-page novel to plant something at the end of chapter one and harvested 189 pages later. And I happened to be on Long Island visiting my mom, who was in an assisted living place that was probably walking distance from East Egg or West Egg. Um, I, 
um, where uh, where Gats all this happened, uh, North Shore of Long Island. I'm on the Long Island uh, Railroad, and I'm rereading the novel, and I come to the scene where Nick has arranged this lunch where Daisy and Gatsby are going to uh, be reunited for the first time. And they meet, and Gatsby, making sort of casual conversation, says something about, mentions the green light. And she says, what green light? So it doesn't have any meaning for her. And suddenly, the meaning of this light now, I don't know, becomes more complicated. But I happened to look at I said, okay, there it is. And I happened to look at the page number. And um, this reference to the green light happens in the, if I can use this word, in, in the exact center of the novel. Can't remember what page it was. Exact center of the of the novel. So that was a third reference. Is that right? That was a third reference, but it was the second reference where Gatsby is saying, "No, this green light isn't going to have enough meaning if I just plant it in the beginning and harvest it at the end. I've got to water it in the middle." I've got to remind the reader that it's a signifier. Mm-hmm. And boy, that's a, that's, that's a rich strategy for, for me, Mike, is that a lot of us plant stuff in the middle, depending on the length of the story or the article or the essay. We harvest it at the end. Uh, we kind of make a circle. But... You know, when strategically does it make sense to remind the readers, to have an echo of the beginning somewhere in the middle that now better prepares the reader for the payoff? That's x-ray reading to me. You know who else does that? Well, a lot of people do it. But one of the famous writers who do it, contemporary writers, is John Irving, where he'll have like a, a a phrase that's kind of a runner throughout his his novel. Now, he normally would do it more than a few times, but yeah. you know what you're talking about, you know, when I write cover profiles for example for the magazine, I try to end it where I began it and create that circularity you're talking about where there's a sense of completeness, like you've come full circle. But when you're doing long form writing like a novel, obviously, um your point being that um a lesson learned is that Fitzgerald understood that it's not going to make the impact or maybe even have um, maybe even wouldn't be recognized at the end of the novel if he didn't, as you say, water it there in the middle and and make sure that the reader had captured that and tuned into it and was prepared for the final and not uh, unwittingly prepared for the 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 grand finale of the novel. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a um, uh, it's a remarkable work and uh but but i think the you, you know um i was teaching a college class the other day from uh, they're visiting elon college and um uh, i'm very um, tuned into uh to music and um i have mike i have a tiny little keyboard here uh would you be willing for me to try to? I just want to play uh, about uh, uh, fifteen seconds from a song. Would that work for you? Go right ahead. Okay. We've never had a musical performance on here before. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I bought this this piano uh, for uh, this uh, for fifty dollars. Uh, it weighs two pounds. I'm holding it in my hand. Can you hear that? Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, it's kind of tinny. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's it only weighs two pounds. Okay, <laughs> not a lot of bass, not a lot of bottom end to this one. All right, here we'll give you a little bottom. Here we go. Ready? People will recognize that as three blind mice, right? Yes. Well, I heard Wynton Marsalis. 
teach that song to a group of children to teach them how uh, to appreciate uh, classical music. And what he taught them was that uh, he, he took this little song and he slowed it down and he broke it up into its constituent parts. I would say he was X-ray listening to the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he introduced the idea of a musical phrase. Hang on. Okay, so it goes. Here I am. That's repeated. Okay, then you have. Uh, an elaboration of that phrase, not three notes, but four notes repeated. That's part two. Part three is a longer phrase repeated three times. It just seems like when you play it fast, like a blend, but I'm going to slow it down. One. Two. Three. And what's the end? What's the kicker? Right back where we started from. Yeah. So if you were to, yeah. if you were to, if you wanted to, to teach about the architecture of music or the architecture of stories, you could plot that song as A A B B C C C A, and just as the Ring trilogy to use a much longer work, begins in the Shire, leads to a journey, returns to the Shire where things can never be the same again. Um, same with a novel like Siddhartha. Uh, this ring structure, this circle structure, where things are uh, uh, repeated but elaborated. It's um, it's It's... It's so powerful, and I, I really like it when I can learn to appreciate it, not just from written texts, but from visual images. Um, because it's, it's communication, whether it's visual, auditory, or whether it's reading or looking at images rather than words. Uh, it's a communication technique that, that's really universal. So you, you mentioned uh, Robert McKee's story by Robert McKee. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Robert McKee's book story uh, has uh, just a wonderful, uh, uh, useful strategy, uh, which he describes as the inciting incident. Um, and uh, 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 I love that because... Uh, there are so many examples of it, not just in screenplays, but in all different kinds of um, fictional and nonfiction uh, stories. Um, isn't, uh, I can't remember whether it's Frodo or Bilbo who is having the birthday party <laughs> when Gandalf arrives, you know, uh, and suddenly uh, nothing is quite the same. Um, uh, at night, one of my rituals uh, has been around 10 o'clock before I get sleepy. Uh, I watch an old episode of um, Law and Order, one of the original episodes. Mm -hmm. And um, highly structured, highly formulaic, right? And how does it begin? It begins with ordinary New Yorkers stumbling upon a corpse. Those New Yorkers uh, have no other role usually than to, than to do that. And then the cops come. And then halfway through, the lawyers uh, get, in, get involved. And so this idea that anybody who's been in a car accident understands the inciting incident because it changes the nature of your day. And the, your goal in real life is to restore order, restore normal life, uh, to overcome the effects of the accident uh, or, or the tragedy. 
So, um, um, you know, sometimes what the kind of thing we're talking about is dismissed as being like formulaic. But I do believe that it takes a formula to be an Olympic diver, um, you know, off the three meter platform or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do. It doesn't mean it's not beautiful to behold. It doesn't mean that there aren't wonderful variations along the way. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you've got, there, there are fundamentals uh, of storytelling and there are time, you know, time tested, time honored ways of telling a story. But then even within that, the x-ray reading that you talk about, for instance, the opening line of Moby Dick, which I'd like you to, such a simple line. It almost sounds like a throwaway um, in the beginning, but you do quite an analysis of it. And I want to say before you do that, I want to say the reason why I feel like x-ray reading is such an important subject is that I hear over and over again, people saying, if you want to be a good or great writer, write, just write, write, write. But the truth of the matter is you, it's critical to have good source material to read. I mean, when I was growing up as, as a basketball player, if somebody just said, all you have to just practice, practice, practice. If I didn't watch Earl Monroe and Julius Irving and Walt Frazier and Oscar Robertson play basketball, I wouldn't have known any of those moves, any of those movements that, that turn you into a really good basketball player. And ditto for writing. It's like if you're not reading high quality writing, to begin with, you're at a deficit if you're not reading good writing. But then secondly, just like we learn the English language or any language, it's emulation. And if we can't emulate, which is distinct, from, of course, from um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for from plagiarism. Yeah. Uh, emulation is, is different. You can use those same techniques. You're not going to talk about the green light, but that, that same technique used by Fitzgerald um, can be used by us or um, Herman Melville's techniques. What about that opening line of Moby Dick? Call me Ishmael. Again, sounds almost like a throwaway. I could see an agent today, if you sent something like that out today and he or she wasn't familiar with Moby Dick, is like, what's that? They, they, the opening line is just a throwaway, but it's not at all in your reading of it. So I have a, um, I have a story which I was at a conference years ago, just pretty much when I was new to journalism. And I was sitting around a, an oval table and the conference was being recorded. And it, it was about some issue, issue or crisis in, uh, in, in journalism. And uh, in my, I finished my commentary with a little joke where I said, um, you know, call me naive, Call me irresponsible. Call me Ishmael. So uh, a month or so goes by, and they've created the transcript of uh, the entire conference. <laughs> and my boss brings it in and says, what is this? <laughs> and I read it, and it says, uh, call me naive. Call me irresponsible. Call me a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the poor author. something was lost in transcription <laughs> poor transcriber uh, but but i guess that was my punishment uh for uh for showing off my you got a uh, little arcane my yeah, little yeah. esoteric <laughs> yeah. so here's what i wrote and uh and i think it says the short sentence as gospel is the sub the the su subtitle for this in the book. It says, "Call me Ishmael." What makes that a perfect sentence? I can make a list. One, it is a short, short sentence within a long, long novel. Two, it introduces the first person narrator. Three, it has an oddly potent structure, not the standard subject verb object. When I tried to decipher the syntax, the best I could come up with was imperative verb, indirect object, and I haven't the foggiest idea. 
the experts at languagelog.com steered me toward, quote, verb, direct object, and the always popular predicate complement, unquote. Number four, the sentence has some mystery to it. The narrator doesn't give you his real name, and you wonder why. Number five, it introduces a biblical illusion, one that points to an outcast, alienated son, Ishmael from the Old Testament. Then I write, um, that is so much work done so efficiently. Author Tom Wolfe once argued that when readers confront a short, short sentence, they treat it as the gospel truth. At the Pointer Institute, we call this the, quote, Jesus wept effect, a reference to one of the shortest sentences in the Bible. When Jesus returns home to discover that his cousin Lazarus has died, his response is profoundly human. Many who may doubt the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead are less likely to doubt this moment, quote, Jesus wept. The simple power of two words, subject and verb, should encourage, encourage us to cast our most important ideas in the shortest possible sentences. So I haven't read that, that little passage in uh, probably since I, I wrote the book. And having read it, I have to say it feels pretty good to me. So if I'm... Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's why I singled it out. I, I thought uh, your analysis of it, how you broke it down that way. And then another one is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, which I just got done just uh, incidentally. You mentioned Shirley Clark. I'm, I'm sorry, Shirley Jackson earlier. And Shirley Jackson, I just, I read her biography recently and uh, Red Comet is the name of the Sylvia Plath, huge biography. Um, I mean, really, it's a, it's a big book. It's written by Heather Clark. That's why I called it, not because you're here, Roy, Roy but Heather Clark is the name of the author of Red Comet, uh, Sylvia Plath's uh, biography, or one of them. But it's a big, it's considered to be maybe the, the mm -hmm. definitive one because it's huge. Uh, agonizing because you know what the ending is. Sure. But, uh, it's it's such a journey to get there. But that opening line of the novel she wrote called The Bell Jar, and I'll just go ahead and read it and have you launch from there. It goes like this. It was a queer, sultry summer. The summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs. And I don't know what I was doing in New York. Yeah, you know, when you said... Uh, I was I have the book with me, and I was uh, just flipping through it to the section on Sylvia Plath, and this is kind of a uh, my my mother, sh whose name was Shirley Clark, um, always described herself. She was a good Catholic lady who, who uh, always thought she was like clairvoyant, and she would she would say that uh, you know I'm 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 a witch, Roy. Your mother's a witch, and as I was flipping through. I flipped through uh, the, I happened to come across the de dedication page. And when you said the name Shirley Clark, I read to my brothers, Vincent Clark and Ted Clark, for their tender care of our mom, Shirley Clark, who at age 95 was still singing. So that's a, um, uh, I have little chills on my arm here, so that you spoke her name by mistake, <laughs> mm -hmm. just at the moment that I uh, uh, that I saw it. And she is um, she is kind of part of my, of um, my analysis or understanding or curiosity or obsession with uh, the bell jar and those opening lines. Um, so, uh, I, I write at length, um, uh, and this is actually a, I'll just throw this in, uh, Roy, that this is, uh, a blending of historical fact, the Rosenbergs being executed and something that bothered her a great deal in her life and, um, and fiction. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so let's. I mean, one of the things, the thing about a writing tool, 
so, so my book, Writing Tools, is the first in a sequence of these books that I did for, uh, for Little, Little Brown. And it's by far the most popular, best-selling of the, uh, of the books. Been translated into Arabic and Chinese, and I uh, rarely does a, a day go by when I don't hear from a, uh, a reader of that. And and one of my favorite uh, strategies, number it's number two in in the chapters, is um, order words for emphasis. And um, I often refer to a very short sentence in Shakespeare's Macbeth. And I just, my, we, our family just watched uh, the Denzel, Denzel Washington version and the new version just the other night. So it came home to me. And at the end of the, um, uh, of the play, um, uh, just before Macbeth is about to be beheaded for his crime of uh, he and his Lady Macbeth, his wife, kill the king, assassinate him. Um, she dies of insanity. And uh, there's a scream off stage, and someone comes on and says, um, The queen, my lord, is dead. I became fascinated with that line. I want to punctuate it. The queen, comma, my lord, comma, is dead, period, or what the Brits would call full stop. Mm -hmm. And my first impulse was that that was, that was written by right, a playwright for an actor to deliver. Uh, there are other vo versions. The versions that I would have written, I would have written, the queen is dead, my lord. Uh, I could have also written, my lord, the queen is dead. And Yoda might have declared, dead the queen is. But Shakespeare's version is the only one with two commas in it. Now, I'm, I'm X-ray reading those six words. And so, mm -hmm. so what it gives me is something really important at the beginning, the subject, the queen. Something less important my Lord in the middle and something very important at the end is dead, period. Stick the landing, drop the mic. And it turns out that emphatic word order, as Strunk and White have it, I think, place the most important words in a sentence at the end, which is another example. Or mm -hmm. how about the way we tell jokes? Uh, I dropped my toothpaste, he said, crestfallen. Or how about, <laughs> how about Michelle Obama saying in a speech, in oratory, I woke up this morning in a house that was built by slaves, period, the White House. So we have all these examples in different forms of writing where the emphatic word comes at the end. Okay? Now, um, but that doesn't always imply, uh, it doesn't always apply. And that's the good thing about a writing tool as opposed to a writing rule. So when Sylvia Plath gives us, it was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs. And I didn't know what I was doing in New York. You know, when I read that, uh, in a bookstore not that long ago, I said, oh, my goodness, the Rosenbergs. Now, I have to reveal that the Rosenbergs, at the when they were arrested for espionage, giving aid supposedly to, um, to Russia, so, the Soviet Union, uh, they were living in a large apartment complex on the Lower East Side of New York called Knickerbocker Village. And so were we. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I lived there for the first four years of my life. I, I was there the same time as the Rosenberg's two sons. When they were electrocuted, my uncle Pete and my aunt Millie, 
were on a waiting list for an apartment and they got that, um, they wound up having their first apartment before they had their children in the Rosenberg's apartment. So, so it, it's an odd and rare and uh, uh, like personal connection. So the Rosenberg's were always on, uh, on my mind, but they're, they've been on everybody's mind. Uh, there's a new novel uh, um, called The Vixen in which uh, Ethel plays uh, an important role. Uh, she's a character in the play Angels in America. There's a new biography uh, uh, about her. Um, Roy Cohn, uh, who is uh, uh, Senator McCarthy's uh, legal hitman and, and was Donald Trump's father's uh, lawyer, you know, and so all of these these connections. But what I what I think is so fascinating is that yes, you can put a bump in the road, right? You can plant in the middle of an otherwise straightforward sentence uh, a mystery that has to be solved. And that mystery is solved to go exactly the same way uh, with a slightly different geometry, I suppose, than The Great Gatsby, which is that the character played by um, uh, the, the fictional character who is uh, Sylvia Plath, um, winds up talking to somebody. She's young. She's working at a magazine. She's in New York. Um, kind of bad things are happening to her. And uh, she makes a comment about how horrible what a horrible thing it is that th this execution is going to take place. And her friend who sees it a different way says something like, yes, isn't it horrible that such people could exist? That is the Rosenbergs on the face of the earth. Later in the novel, sorry about this, because uh, it's, it's a spoiler, in an attempt, after an attempt to commit suicide, as she eventually would in her real life. She wakes up in a, what, a sanatorium, a, 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 me, a me, mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And she finds herself being led down a hallway with bars on the window, strapped to a table with electrodes strapped to her head where they administer you know, not with wicked intent, but with, they administer electric shock, shock therapy to her. And back when it was very crude, a very crude yeah. uh, treatment back then. Yeah. And, and says to herself, and, and, she, and the novelist says, you know, uh, I wondered what terrible thing I had done to receive such punishment. So what do we have? We have the Rosenbergs planted, the electrocution of planted in the first sentence. It echoes a little later, and then essentially she becomes the Rosenbergs. She becomes essentially the one who is tied down and electrocuted. It's just it's 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 a high level of artistic achievement from probably one of the most troubled writers who ever lived. And that's saying something. Yeah, it really is. Now, and that was, I believe, her only novel. She wrote a lot of poetry. And I think that was, I may be wrong mm -hmm. about that, but that obviously a celebrated novel. She's yeah. well known for it. But I think it was the only one she wrote. I may be wrong again. You know, you talk about the power of short sentences. Um, one of the things, we don't have time for you to get into this part, but your description of the beginning of um, The Sun Also Rises, uh, that's another terrific, I'm, I'm inviting everybody to get your hands on this book, um, and the analysis of, of that beginning and seeing it through the x-ray eyes of Roy Peter Clark, uh, it's a different reading. It's a whole different reading versus 
looking at it. And it has a lot to do with reading for not just for story, but reading for uh, reading for structure, reading for intent, reading for hidden meaning um, and so on. You know, you do say, Roy, uh, read poetry. You think that that's kind of uh, the highest. It, it, it invite not only invites, but requires x-ray reading. And then you also talk about reading the Bible and not for religious purposes to make people religious or more religious, you say. But there is. So why don't you talk about both of those poetry and the Bible? Why are those two of the things that you think people can um, can really bone up on to improve their writing? Yeah, I want to mention uh Mike, just because she recently uh, died, um, that in my chapter, my chapter on Hemingway is called X-Ray, Hemingway, and Didion. And so mm, um, that's right. uh, the chapter contains um, a, a, an analysis, a paragraph of her analysis of the opening of... Um, of Hemingway's uh, novel. So it's, it's so interesting. It became a kind of, for me, a sort of like a, uh, a double X-raying, which is uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm watching jo- Joan Didion watching Hemingway mm-hmm. and uh, a kind of, in a kind of a, <laughs> a double meta dance or kind of a, a literary menage where, um, yeah, um, uh, she is seeing things that are invisible to me, but she's helping me. She's giving me lenses. She's, uh, she's, she's sharpening my vision. And, um, I, I think that's, uh, you know that's that's a pow- powerful thing. I mean, the the, the great thing about um, uh, about reading the Bible or listening to stories or thinking about stories uh, in the Bible um, is that it, it turns us back to. Um, to writing which happened, you know, more than 2,000 years ago, which still bear, which helped invent the strategies and the modes and the methods and the themes that we still depend upon. Okay, so are you a Seinfeld fan? I am. Uh, I've seen the show sometimes. I'm not a huge uh, watcher of TV series. Okay, but but I, I I'm familiar with the show. Well, I am familiar. In the last episode, which some people like, I think it had two parts. In the last uh, episode, um, the four main characters uh, are put on trial, <laughs> and they're prosecuted for a crime. I'll describe it in just a second. But the, it enables the, uh, the directors and the, sh- the showrunners to bring back <laughs> all of the characters who these char- uh, our main characters have screwed over <laughs> over seven, eight, or nine years. Like, the, you know, it's, it's very, very funny. Um, but they violate, in I think Lowell, Massachusetts, the Good Samaritan Law where instead of helping this fat man who is being mugged, they ridicule him while it's going on and they're busted. And what I thought was, oh my gosh, here is this highly comedic, irreverent story. And what is it? kind of based upon, it's based upon the parable of the Good Samaritan, which uh, receives very, very careful, respectful treatment, honored treatment. Uh, I believe in my book, I write too much, so I lose track of where things go, how to write short. 
Uh, yes. Because the parable uh, is something like, uh, you know, uh, actual parable is like 140, 48 words. And when I x-ray read that, what I see is um, I, I, I sort of honor uh, Jesus or whoever the uh, actual writer was as being as sort of a, like a, a highly efficient and skilled storyteller. Uh, there's a man who's going down uh, from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho along this pathway, and he's just doing his thing. And um, we don't know anything about the man, and suddenly he comes upon uh, a man in a ditch. Look, how... Why is that different than the opening of uh, Law and Order? <laughs> exactly. The man isn't dead, but he's he's uh, dying. And uh, two other men have passed him by. But this third man, the sort of sacred number th three, picks him up. And by the way, we learned that the man is a Samaritan, which means that he is a despised outsider to the Jewish tribes. So it's not a countryman or a tribesman who helps the man. It's, it's this stranger. And the stranger has three things with him, three details that we learned that are focused on his own comfort. He has a donkey or a beast of burden. He has wine and oil. And he has gold coins, uh, Roman coins, denarii, right? And instead of using them on himself, he washes the man's wounds with the wine and the oil. He um, puts him on his donkey. He leads him into an inn, and he pays the innkeeper. He says, on the way back, I'll check in. If this isn't enough, I'll give you more. So this is all in response to the lawyer's question of Jesus, like, you say I should love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? And so out of this, out of this, um, this kind of abstraction of neighborliness comes this amazing story, which becomes embodied in our language 2,000 years later. If there's no other reason, if I haven't if, if I haven't given enough evidence as why is to, <laughs> why is you should read the Bible or think about Bible stories, I don't have anything better than that. Right, right, and it's timeless. You know, I find more and more when I write that I don't want timestamps in the copy. I don't want references to virtual reality goggles or texting or what have you, because all of a sudden it timestamps it. Yeah, where it's a certain period of time. Or it's outmoded suddenly because we don't text anymore. We use telepathy. Uh, so, uh, and there are certain things that are timeless. And for instance, just the interactions between people, sans technology or sans any kind of technology. So, yeah. um, so that the, the piece of writing actually can stand the test of time, uh, not just because it's, it's good quality writing or it's a good story, but it actually doesn't make jolt the reader into thinking, oh, this is uh, back when they had to hand crank a car. Mm -hmm. right. um, I didn't realize that until now sort of thing. What about poetry? Well, you know, I, um, I, I'll put it this way. I think I treat, I think I treat all texts as poetry. I think the difference between poetry and prose is the uh, compression of meaning and language. But that doesn't have to make it um, uh, just literary. Uh, it can make it uh, practical as well. And uh, here I'm thinking that um, uh, Titles, headlines, headline writers have an important meaning to make within 
a short space. And titles, uh, so uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, a television franchise from the 90s, um, I thought was remarkable in part just for the very uh, language of the title, where you have these two elements, uh, the vampire slayer, you know, and who is not like Dr. Von Helsing, who was a German philosopher, but a uh, a sixteen year old California high school girl, like with the name Buffy. So, so now, the man who Joss Whedon who created that title was knew that you could put two things together that didn't belong t- together. Uh, but T. S. Eliot has his title as well. And his title for a famous poem written 100 years ago is The Love Song, not of Romeo and Juliet, not of um, Casanova. It's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, a very cold British banker's name, two things that don't go along together. So when it came time to write my book, for Little Brown uh, about grammar, I had a concept of grammar that I wanted to capture in the way a poet might capture it. And so they, you, you don't, uh, an author doesn't always get to choose their title, right? Um, Fitzgerald wanted to call the great Gatsby Trimalchio at West Egg. So, uh, Let's thank um, uh, Maxwell Perkins, his editor, from talking him out of it. Um, but my my title was "The Glamour of Grammar," which is probably my favorite title for one of my own books. And yes, it works on the same premise: two things that don't belong together are placed together, and they rub. And though that rub creates a friction, creates heat, creates light, creates energy, a uh, little uh, uh, dissonance. And uh, it's a source of creativity in music, in the visual arts, and in language. Mm-hmm. And I know one of the writers you greatly respect because you uh, analyze his work is Vladimir Nabokov. Mm-hmm. And the first, when you talk about, you know, Writing prose being poetry, the first 20 or 30 pages of Lolita are some of the greatest writing I've ever read. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It was kind of this fusion of uh, prose and poetry, and uh, it was just incredible. You know, we're running long here, Roy, but I want to... I want to thank you for taking the time You're and welcome, discussing X-ray reading. The book is beautifully written. Um, and uh, now I know I need to get onto writing tools. If they're reading it in the Arab world and everywhere else, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to add that one to my list as well. Um, so thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Mike, if you want to talk about writing tools someday, call me back. We'll do this again. <laughs>